So first of all, I'd really like to thank the organizing committee for organizing this conference because it's, it's a really important one for students on in Ireland. Um, and it was difficult to organize, no doubt, this time with everything that's going on. Today, I want to talk about something that's what I think is inherently interesting to people. Um, I think we all have a, an innate desire to, to rank things. So no matter what you're interested in, there's always a, a ranking question of some sorts. So it could be Pele or Maradona. Um, it could be the Rolling Stones or the Beatles, Kendall or Kylie Jenner, anything like that. There's always a question of what's the best, right? Um, now, there's a lot of problems with that, uh, mainly because most of these questions are driven by emotion. So it's things like your childhood memory, personal preferences, rather than via a quantitative approach of ranking things. Um, so today I'm going to talk about this problem. So using a, a quantitative approach to, to rank elements, and I'm going to frame it via the sport of snooker. But that is really just a vehicle to represent some of the results. The, the things I'm actually going to talk about are extremely generalizable and applicable to a wide range of different domains. So first of all, the, the plan of attack for today is really I'm going to introduce the idea of ranking things within complex systems that are all around us and some of the problems and things that we need to do that. And then, like I say, as a, a driving force, I'm going to use Snooker and talk about how it has its own problems in terms of ranking competitors within the sport. And then I'm going to show you how we can actually interpret a networked representation of the data, in particular from the sport of snooker in this case. And once we have that network representation, I'm going to talk about a, a mathematical framework which we can use to obtain rankings. And then I'm going to show you some of the results we obtained from that before finally wrapping up. Again, the things that I'm talking about are entirely applicable to an arbitrary domain of interest, but I will come back to snooker repeatedly throughout. Um, so the motivation, we have a complex system. Um, it's got a, a number of different entities or things. In our case, it's going to be competitors within the sport, but it could be animals out in the wild. It could be memes on Twitter competing for interest. And then the question is really, how do we rank those competing entities? Um, now, again, like I say, the majority of cases, I think we're at the time of year now where the people start talking about the top 100 movies of 2020 and things like that. But a lot of that, again, is driven by emotion, right? It's very subjective. So what I want to really use here is a, a quantitative approach towards ranking. Um, now, in order to do that, we um, require detailed data describing the interactions. Okay? And that's one of the big problems with a lot of the um, domains people talk about. So take the movie example. There isn't really much data regarding the interactions between competing movies. Um, you could just look at the, the box office grossing, I guess, but that's not really representative of, of what's going on. Uh, very rarely does the highest grossing movie win the Oscar. Um, so we need cases where we can actually interpret the results of competition between these entities, which is partly why I'm using Snooker. Um, it's any time in which there's detailed data describing results, we can take advantage of that. Um, and once we have that data, I'm going to show you in a few slides how we can learn about a network describing what's going on within the complex system. Um, now, these aren't new questions. These have been studied for over two decades now. So back in the late 90s, there was um, two papers that appeared where they were looking at the, the exact same question from web pages. So how to rank web, web pages. Um, both these papers are extremely highly cited, nearly 20,000 citations each. But the two authors there, Sergey Brin and, and Lawrence Page, they, they did very well out of this. They, they founded Google. Um, you, it's essentially using the exact same ideas that I'm going to think about in terms of taking things that are competing and providing a definitive ranking. So when you Google something, why does it appear first or second or third in the, the search results? OK, so okay, a bit, a bit about Snooker. It's not entirely necessary to know what Snooker is here, but I think it, it might help the flow of the talk a bit. So Snooker is a queue-based game. Um, so the player at the very top of the picture there is holding a cue. And the idea is that you, you strike a cue ball, so this, this white ball here, into one of the balls of color. Okay, so for example, maybe he's aiming for the blue ball here. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure, but we can imagine. And the aim is to strike the ball into one of the pockets. Okay, so the holes in the corner and sides of the table. And if you do that successfully, you get a certain number of points. So here, 
O'Sullivan has 23 points so far. Um, and the idea is that you keep doing that until you miss, right? So if you miss, your opponent gets a go and the game continues until either there are no balls left or your opponent concedes. And if that happens, you win what's known as a frame. So Selby has 10 frames here so far. And you play this repeatedly. So it's a new set of balls for every frame um, until you win a majority. So this game here, for example, is the best of 33. Seems like a lot, it is. Um, these games can go on for three or four days at times. So it's not a, a quick quick process. Some people um, tell me that it's similar to pool. I think they haven't played more snooker because it's, it's much more difficult in my opinion. Uh, if anybody here has played both, I hope they'd agree with me. And the idea behind the professional sport of snooker is that there's a, um, a number of tournaments each year in which players compete in, right? They're generally knockout tournaments and you play until you win, right? You get that final and if you win that final, you win. And then classically, the way that snooker ranked the competitors within the sport was on a, a points-based uh, method. So on depending on the tournaments you played in and won or had wins in, you obtained a certain amount of points and then they tallied them at the end of the season to see who was the best. That changed in, um, in 2013. So instead of being based on directly points, it was instead based upon the prize money that you won for appearing in tournaments. Um, and that was a very nice idea at the time, but more recently it's become a bit of a problem, I think. So if you look at this plot here, it's showing the, the distribution of prize funds in each of the tournaments in Snooker across the past 10 years. And so from 20, 2009, 2013, it was a very good idea because it was pretty symmetric, right? There was one skewed point at the very end there. But in more recent times, as Snooker has become more popular in recent years, the distribution of these prize funds have become increasingly skewed. So certain players can get a very high ranking by performing well in a very select few number of tournaments. It's all kind of motivation. There's a problem with the ranking scheme in snooker. So that was another reason for taking it as the, the question of interest here. So what do we do? Well, we needed data, like I say. So one thing that's great about sports is that there's always fanatics that will collect data from extended periods of time. So on this website, qtracker.net, there's over 100 years worth of results from, from snooker games. So what we did was we scraped that entire website. Um, and in particular, we're gonna focus on when snooker became professional, right? So when people started making a living from it in 1968. And with that filter, it ends up that we have over 600 unique tournaments, which featured over 1200 players and nearly 50,000 actual matches between those players. Secondly, we also obtained um, the official rankings, so from the actual sport of snooker, they, have, they produce official rankings, like I mentioned before. We have them from 1975. That's when they started publicly producing them. And I'll come back to that in a minute, actually. So a bit of a look at the, the data itself. Um, so on the bottom left here, I'm just showing the, the distribution of the number of tournaments in each season within the sport. Uh, I think this is actually an interesting plot because it, it really tells the, the story of snooker. Uh, so let me walk you through it a bit. So snooker became professional in the, the late 60s, like I say, but again, it was fairly low profile until the mid 70s. Um, and a big part of the reason for that is color television became a thing. So snooker was a, a real poster boy, I guess you can call it for, for color television because spectators could see the color of the ball that was being potted. Um, so that drove an increase in snooker's popularity throughout the 70s and 80s. Um, one of the problems was that snooker had a, a deep relationship with the tobacco industry. Um, so the, the, the UK government decided to ban tobacco advertisement in snooker in the, the mid noughties there. So you can see that tailing off from the late nineties to mid noughties um, and reaching, I guess, a local minimum around 04, 05. But then it did start to increase in popularity again. So an, a new committee came in and changed many things, including how they ranked the players. And that resulted in a growth in the popularity in snooker around the world, really, whereas where now there's over 20 tournaments every year. Plot on the right just shows the number of players that appeared in those tournaments um, in each season. And it follows really the same shape, so it's telling the same story there. So that's kind of the, the background story of snooker. In terms of the results, so the interactions between the players or the elements of this complex system, um, we can look at the distribution so we can count the number of times each player has won or lost their, their total number of appearances. Let's just focus on the number of games they've won for the moment. 
So that's the, the red dots here on the, the left plot. That describes the probability of finding a player who's won n games. Now, what I really want you to see here is that it's on a log-log scale. So it's, it's a heavy tail distribution, which is indicative of a complex system. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, the plot on the right is showing the similar thing, but it's the, um, it's the probability of having n or more matches. Okay? And again, it's log-log scale, very heavy tailed. So that suggests there's some kind of complex system going on here. Right, so if there's a complex system, we should be able to interpret a network within that. Um, show me the network, I guess. So here's an example one where we have three players, Steve Davies, Steve Hendry, and Ronnie O'Sullivan. Where do we get the network? So suppose Hendry and Ronnie O'Sullivan play and Hendry wins. I can draw an edge from Hendry to Ronnie, okay? And then Ronnie plays Steve Davies, Ronnie wins again. I can draw another edge. So every time one player loses to another, I just draw an edge. So now. Steve Davies has lost Stephen Hendry, so I can draw that edge. And suppose that Ronnie's playing Hendry again, and Ronnie O'Sullivan wins. No, no, no guessing who my favorite player is here, it's Ronnie. Um, but we don't really just use two edges, we actually just assign a weight to the edges. So this is a, an edge with weight two now. Um, so that's the, the key quantity of interest here in the network. It's the, this weight, Ji, so the number of times that player J has lost to player I. So we do that across the entire data set. Um, or we can look at any period we want, and I'll talk more about that in a few moments as well. So how do I get a ranking from this? Um, I could just count the number of wins, right? That would be one way, but that really doesn't tell us much because someone could just play very easy opponents all season, so we don't want to do that. Instead, we want a more quantitative approach that can capture some of the more intrinsic features of that system. So we're going to work with this system of equations, okay? So it's a, a system of n, a couple of equations where n is the the number of players in our season. And each player has this level of prestige. So it can be viewed as a kind of credit. Okay, so this is player I's credit. And let me talk you through the terms one by one here. So Q is a, a, a damping factor, right? So that is just like a, a term that allows for randomness to be incorporated. So it's a free bit of prestige that we assign to each player. But the rest of the terms can tell us some interesting things. So again, we have this weight. So the number of times that a given player J has lost to our player of interest I. The thing that's dividing it there, KJ out, is the total number of times the player J has lost. Okay, so taken together, that's like the fraction of J's losses that have come from player I. And that's multiplied by player J's own prestige. Okay, so it's like a transfer of prestige from one player to another, depending on the, the number of times that they've lost. Now, importantly, this, um, this means that results against higher ranked or higher qualified players are more important in the model, right? So it's not just about the wins, but also the quality of the, the wins. The last term there is really just for um, completeness. So it's Kronecker Delta to account for the cases where a player has never lost and they don't have that KJO term. Um, but in fact, it doesn't appear in the data. So don't worry about that. Okay, so we can do that. We can take the entire network over the, the, the period we're interested in. So 1968 to 2020, and we can get some rankings. Um, so in, in I've got 10 to six here. In fifth place, we've got Mark Shelby. This would be more fun in person, I know. Um, in fourth place, we have Stephen Hendry. In third place, Mark Williams, known as the, the Welsh potting machine, actually. Second, this was kind of a surprising result for me, um, Ronnie O'Sullivan, right, the rocket. And lastly, first place, John Higgins, right, the Wizard of Wishaw. Again, this result was very surprising for me. I was sure Ronnie was gonna be before I started this problem. Um, I don't think people will have a lot of interest in this if you're not interested in snooker, but hopefully some people are. But we can look in some more quantitative details about what the model is actually telling us. So if I compare the ranks based upon this prestige model and the ranks based upon the number of wins, I can look at this line. Okay, so the red line here is like a reference. Now, if I take some points in that plot, if I just ranked by wins, Stephen Hendry would be the third best player in the world. But because I ranked by prestige, Mark Williams is. So what this is really telling us is that the wins that Mark Williams had to get, so while he got less than Stephen Hendry, they were against higher quality opponents. So the reference line there allows us to interpret which players have been fortunate in the, their wins in terms of getting easier opponents in, for those players above the line and more difficult opponents for those below the line. So that's one thing we can learn straight away. Um, we can also do a number of other things. So we can look at just filtering on certain seasons. So I can take the, the actual ranks in each given season. So here's the, the 2018 one. And I'm showing two things here. The first one's comparing the prestige ranking and the number of wins. Again, they're very highly correlated. They do well.
But the one on the right is actually showing the official rankings, which doesn't appear to be doing so well, which is extremely interesting, actually, that world snooker are failing to capture a lot of the inherent behavior within the sport of snooker. Um, so, for example, we can see the very, very top point there, Anthony McGill. He has a very, very good rank from Warren Snooker. So based on the prize money, he's won. But a kind of poor rank by, by prestige, okay, your page rank here. So that tells us that he's done well in very, very high profile tournaments in terms of getting prize money, but not so well in terms of the quality of players he was defeating, right? So this can give us an idea of those players who are in some sense lucky to have such a high ranking in the official systems. Some other things we can talk about is um, comparing the approaches. So if I have two different ranking procedures, A and B, I can look at the level of similarity in those two procedures using what's known as the jackyard similarity. So the intersection between the two sets, the size of that divided by the size of the union of the two sets. And we can see a few things. So the plot on the left, just when I take the top five ranks in each season here from 1990 to 2020, um, and the plot on the right showing the top 50. Um, we can see that it's doing really well. So the blue line there is its comparison with just the number of wins, and the pink line is comparison with the official rankings. And what we can really see there, which I find kind of interesting, is that Ward Snooker was doing really poor in terms of capturing the, the, the quality of opponents faced in the early rankings. Okay, so from 1990 up to the mid noughties there, the, the, the similarity between the metrics were very, very off. Um, it has improved in recent years, but it's still not totally high, right? So it's generally between 40 and 45 players are captured in, with compared to the page rank system. So it's getting better, but the price fund distribution is really not adequate at the moment in terms of providing a definitive ranking. So perhaps there are better procedures out there, such as the one we've talked about today. Okay, I'm gonna wrap up really there. So in conclusion, ranking's hard. It's very difficult to, to provide a definitive ranking, but using complex networks and some of the ideas I talked about today, that can help. So I talked about Snooker, but again, it's applicable to any real domain, as long as we have data, okay? So that we need data regarding the interactions of competitors within the complex system. Now, our approach also allows some really interesting things to be looked at. So we can, again, like I mentioned before, talk about those who are lucky in terms of their performance in certain in tournaments. Um, but we could also do showing the all-time rank, right? So give a definitive answer as to who is the best player of all time. We can apply it to arbitrary time periods. So I showed you one specific season. I've also looked at decades, so the best player within each decade. And um, we can do anything like that. Um, also, like I said, the official rankings didn't start until 1975. So we could make inferences about the rankings before that, right? Which we did as well. Um, and also it captures some really good features in terms of being highly correlated with the number of wins and also the capturing the important tournaments because they were correlated for the, the high ranks. So the quality of opponent face to get those high ranks is also captured within the model as we hope. I'm gonna wrap up there by thanking my collaborator, James Gleason, my PhD supervisor in UL. Um, the paper's on archive, it's under review at the moment, so please do check it out if interested. Um, the code and the data that we use and all this is also available on GitHub at that link, so feel free to check it out. And I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Thanks for listening. <laughs>